Climate change deleted from Florida law. What now fuels the new state energy policy? Who wins? What loses? We're going beyond the headlines. The big blinding billboard. A big bright showdown. Miami residents versus Miami money in politics. Six months and counting until the nation votes. Is Florida still in play? <laughs> And tell me something good. South Florida students bring back constitutional gold from the U.S. Capitol. <laughs> the big news of the week and the newsmakers all live this week in South Florida. Good morning. Welcome. I'm Glenna Milberg. We have a lot planned for you this hour. First, though, it is bill signing season. And among the Florida bills the governor signed into law this week, the one simply called Energy Resources charts a sea change in the way Florida decides how to direct energy resources. And the biggest and probably the most controversial part, lines drawn through the words climate change and greenhouse gases, the about face from considering global warming in state energy policy. No more focus on climate friendly products, no consideration of greenhouse gases nor renewable energy grants. The list of lobbyists that worked with lawmakers on the bill includes FPNL, TECO, Gas and Fuel Associations. The stated intent of the law is to ensure adequate, reliable, and cost-effective sources of fuel and energy, also health and welfare, and the economy. And so today, we try to remove the spin and look at what the new law will and will not do from all the angles. And we begin with Kevin Doyle, who is the Florida Executive Director of Consumer Energy Alliance that supported and applauded the new law this week. Kevin, it is good to have you on the program. Hey, good morning, and thanks for having me today. Are, you are in Florida, are you not? I am indeed. I am uh, up in Palm Coast, Florida, not too far from you, a few hours away. Not too far, but too far, and we do Zoom today. <laughs> so welcome. Yeah, exactly. um, your, okay. your organization represents collectively hundreds of energy companies and trucking companies uh, and the like, and so your company comes from this from a business and economic perspective. Is that fair? I think that's fair. I, I would say also too, we have Consumer Energy Alliance represent, you know, hundreds also of small businesses, consumers, agricultural interest. So we kind of have a, you know, an insight into the entire U.S. economy when it comes to energy policies. So when you read this bill, and I know you worked on the bill and were an integral part of it, so you see that it sort of continues to undo a focus that we currently have in Florida on the climate friendly, I think those were the verbatim words in the bill that, that have been taken out, climate friendly practices, renewable energies. So things like gas and oil um, are not renewable energies and that's now where much more of the focus lies and there are opponents calling this a complete going backwards. Do you consider this a backwards move? I would say no. I would say, you know, how many times have you seen, you know, international organizations or federal agencies come up with, you know, great sounding taglines and protecting the environment, and then they do a photo op and then nothing happens. I think Florida and America in general lead the way where you can show that you can protect the environment, protect our beaches, protect our air, but also ensure too that in the conversation that we have to always address the fact that we have to look at affordability and reliability when it comes to energy policy. So and you're, think, yes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying we can have both. Is that, is that what you're saying? 100%, 100%. I mean, think of how many you know people, how many folks work in the tourism industry in Florida? You know, if all of a sudden, you know, we have policies that restrict energy supply, such as natural gas and oil. Oil prices go up, gas prices go up. It's harder for folks to get to Florida. Our hotels suffer, restaurants suffer, theme parks suffer, our beaches suffer. So being able to do both, and over the last 30 years, Consumer Energy Alliance, we did a study recently, and it showed that thanks to natural gas and energy policy that's been a balanced approach, you know, Oxides and emissions have gone down double digits throughout Florida and across the country in many parts. So you could do definitely do both. And it's so important. You know, we have folks in Florida that are retirees and Social Security that you have to always balance out. So it's so important to, you know, consider 
you know, what that policy means and to ensure that we don't do anything to upset folks' pocketbooks and address the affordability and reliable part of energy policy. In the bill, the intent absolutely verbatim says affordability, energy affordability. But I, I'm really, I want to rewind a little bit because I want to really understand what you're talking about. CEA, does CEA acknowledge the science that the earth is warming? I mean, let, let's just start there. Does CEA acknowledge that science? CEA is an advocate for extreme environmental stewardship. You know, we definitely, again, we think it's a false choice out there when you say you have to have one or the other. You know, we always have to address to make sure that environment is taken care of, but you can't neglect the folks that are, you know, who are the most, most vulnerable to price, you know, inflation, what you're seeing across the country, and you have to be able to provide affordable energy, reliable energy, but you can do both. You can do all three. I hear you. I hear exactly what you're saying. I'm, I'm just, um, for, for the purposes of my next question, does CEA acknowledge, like Governor DeSantis does, acknowledge that the earth is warming? You know, I think the earth, you know, has continuously had changes in its climate, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, America is leading the way, you know, with environmental stewardship, you know, you see that, you know, again, all of our emissions are going down across the across the planet. You know, we are in exciting times right now. You know, in Florida, you have developments in hydrogen, renewable, renewable natural gas, you know, LNG, you know, and our cruise ships and our space travel, you know, a lot of exciting things. And I think Florida has embraced renewables and different forms of energy. And I think it's important that we continue down that path. So I, I want to do, to your point, make clear that that in the bill and in the new law, which is July 1st, goes into effect, there does remain a focus on research, development, and use of renewables. That does not go away. Uh, so to your point, there is sort of both in the law, but you mentioned that emissions have gone down. Um, if emissions have gone down under the last decade or so of a Florida law that is focused on climate change and friendly climate products. Might that trend reverse under this new law when that is taken out? I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot of environmental regulations that are in place, you know, throughout the state, throughout the country. And again, the trend is there. The trend line shows that America continues to go down with emissions across the board while the rest of the world needs to catch up. You know, we, we talk about the debates across the across the country on environmental stewardship, but while China, India, and other countries, you know, are are definitely lagging behind, and the importance of being able to develop our own energy resources here in America, and this bill also helps develop those in Florida as well, so we're not at the mercy of folks in OPEC, Venezuela, and other places. I, I want to read you a tweet that the governor had put out. Again, a governor who has uh, stewarded billions into the environment, a governor who has acknowledged that the earth is warming, but says he's not sure why. This tweet said recently, Florida rejects the designs of the left to weaken our energy grid, pursue a radical climate agenda, and promote foreign adversaries. Uh, this puts a very political and partisan tone on to what you're talking about this new law that really does sort of include both. How, how has this whole issue become so partisan, do you think? It, it's a good question, because I think at the end of the day, you know, Democrats, Republicans, independents, we all benefit from you know, affordable energy, reliable energy, and good environment. So I'd like to think that we can all work together to pursue all three of those things when it comes to energy policy, because it shouldn't be a partisan issue. It should be an issue that, you know, it, it's important for national security, for energy security, and to ensure that our economy is moving along. And in Florida's case, it definitely is. Kevin Doyle, director of the Consumer Energy Alliance. It is great to have you on the program, and I do appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And coming up next, the other side of the story, environmental groups calling Florida's new law a major step backwards. We'll explore that next. Florida's new energy law actually takes effect July 1st. Until then, the current law has language that says, quote, it recognizes the importance of reducing greenhouse gas emissions in state government operations. That gets crossed out, as do all references to climate change. In practical terms, does that matter and how much?
Here to talk about that is Raymer McGuire, who is Policy Director for the Climate Leadership Engagement Opportunities Institute, better known by its acronym, which is CLEO Institute. Raymer, great to have you at the table. Thank you for having me here. You saw our interview with the CEA Executive Director. So, you know, climate change in the law that is about to take effect is not a priority anymore in the law, but it's not non-existent in the wording. So how, I, I guess my first question is how, how bad or good will the practical effects of this law be? The current law recognizes that greenhouse gases and our emissions are making climate change worse. It recognizes that by improving energy efficiency, we can reduce our emissions. And this new law removes that language. So this new law, it, it takes a major step backwards in the recognition that climate change is real, that climate change is human caused, and there's actions that we can take to reduce the impact. Okay, so as a headline, there's a couple of things I wanna push back on a little bit. So as a headline, it, it does take out the words, but it doesn't really take out the intent because it actually does include research development for renewables, um, the promoting of the use of renewables alongside the oil and gas and current energy methods? Well, very specific and limited renewables. So it does include research for hydrogen, mm -hmm. but it also bans wind energy along Florida's entire coastline. Which doesn't really exist, doesn't exist at the moment. And it certainly won't exist if we ban it, which we have now banned it. So if there was new technology to emerge that made wind energy production more efficient at lower speeds, or if, if new technology emerged to make it viable, we wouldn't even be allowed to set it up or to research it in Florida. So it, the wind farms don't exist. Um, the governor actually, from his first campaign, has been against offshore drilling and fracking in Florida. What this does allow for is solar is still a growth industry. Um, it talks about nuclear as a clean energy. So I, I'm trying to sort of take out the spin and the politics and really help people understand this bill come July 1st, will it crash Florida's environment? It won't crash Florida's environment, but we right now have 74% of our energy coming from methane burning gas. Which is oil and gas and coal. Exactly, and it's emitting greenhouse gases. It's making climate change worse. 74% of Florida's energy production. And we don't have gas resources off Florida's coast or in Florida's in Florida, and so we are importing that. Six percent of our energy comes from solar. Solar is renewable, it's less expensive. That wasn't the case five years ago, but it is the case today. So what this bill is doing is it's easing regulations to make it easier to build gas pipelines. It's creating new cost recovery mechanisms. So our bills are gonna go up based on the cost of gas prices and rebuilding gas facilities and it's doing nothing to encourage solar, which is the cheapest, most efficient, and greatest opportunity for Floridians today. You heard Kevin Doyle talk about how emissions have come down. Uh, I do not, sitting here at this desk, have those statistics, do you? We have had, uh, over the last two decades, Florida's source of energy has shifted considerably. We get very, very little of our energy now from coal, which has helped reduce gas emissions. And we've increased for over the last five years from about 2% solar production up to 6% solar production. That has helped reduce emissions. But what has not helped reduce emissions is our over-reliance on, on methane-based gas, which is where we get 74% of our energy today. And if this bill goes into effect the way it's intended, that number is just going to go up. So is there a thought, well, first of all, let me ask you this. So affordability is in the bill. Um, and I think there's no Floridian who does not think affordability is important. How then does the market decide with this new bill whether to put solar panels on their homes or to drive an electric car? Is it fair to say that, that now without regulation and with this growth industry and affordability as an issue, is this a market to decide kind of issue? The market's not deciding when the legislature is banning forms of energy production and easing regulations on others. 
I'm but, but, let me just push back a little. Ban banning the wind farms is in there, but those wind farms don't exist at the moment, but it doesn't ban anything else. There's, there's no other ban in that bill. There's true, but there's also nothing in the bill to promote solar. So I'm an FPL customer. Well, huh? well it oh. says, it says in the bill, solar is still a growth industry. It says that. Which is existing law. That's mm -hmm. not new policy. Uh, I'm an FPL customer. My bill has gone up 52% in the last four years. We are all feeling the pinch. But by Florida being over 70% reliant on natural gas, that puts an immense amount of risk. If natural gas prices shoot up, our bills are going to go up. By investing in the cheapest form of utility scale energy production, which is solar, you insulate yourself from that risk of, of foreign imported gas going up. So the biggest threat to Florida's solar industry right now is what? The biggest threat to solar right now is not having the PSC and the Public Service Commission. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and our that overseas utilities that overseas utilities they right. approve rate hikes and they are helping to guide our energy policy and, and the way it's implemented is not having a PSC and legislative leadership in Tallahassee that's prioritizing renewable energy, which doesn't hurt our environment, doesn't release greenhouse gases, and now because of new advances in technology is actually cheaper than methane-based gas. Is there a push to help utilities monopolize the solar industry? Because it's a pretty, it's a pretty um, public kind of, I mean, there's the sun, and if you've got the, the solar panels, you are the electricity maker. Right, well, two examples where utilities have pushed back against solar. We had net metering, which allows people who put solar panels on their house to get paid a fair rate for the energy that they're putting back on the grid. We had net metering um, phased out through the legislature. Governor DeSantis actually vetoed that because he recognized that ending net metering would just cause all of our utility bills to go up. But Florida Power and Light just a few years ago funded a ballot initiative that would have uh, greatly reduced the ability for homeowners to put solar panels on their, we on their house. That. Yeah, we actually covered it. I know. Uh, but the utility companies are not acting in a way that makes it seem like they want us to put solar panels on our roofs. So this is something we continue to cover. Um, law takes effect July 1st. I appreciate your insight. I, I think it's really important for people to look at things holistically and, and in a nonpartisan way. And I think you helped fill in some of those blanks. So Raymond McGuire, great to have you. Thank you for having me. All right. And light or blight. How did big bright LED billboards sprout up in downtown Miami? Up next, the fight this week to take them down. A not in my backyard fight in downtown Miami currently focuses on these giant LED lighted billboards and more in the pipeline. The argument for them is they'll promote and provide money for the museum and performing arts center where they're located. But what put them there are hundreds of thousands of for profit corporate dollars and political influence. It's an Ohio based media company, a former city commission now lobbyist involved in money transfers and a now suspended Miami commissioner arrested for uh, charges involving alleged corruption. Whew. Damian Pardo is the new Miami commissioner whose district includes the downtown where residents are overwhelmingly against that big blast of lighted billboards right here to talk about <laughs> this kind of only in Miami again story. You know, there's a <clears throat> protest later today yes. at one o'clock. Yes. Uh, there's a meeting on Thursday, your commission, commission meeting. Commission meeting at 930 in the morning. Well, Everyone's welcome. To address this. Correct. You are the district commissioner who wasn't there when this happened. Correct. How did this happen? Correct. Well, you know, I think this is a really important inflection point for the city of Miami. Are we going to continue rewarding corrupt practices or are we going to listen to the residents, the taxpayers, and the electeds who really say these signs need to come down? Okay, so you know, in my position in this chair, I say, whoa, what corrupt practices? Yeah. I mean, what, what happened was not, um, you, you're talking about the money and the influence, was not illegal, perfectly right. legal. Right. Um, and, and perfectly normal and common, I will say, in what we cover in South Florida politics. Right but not what the residents want. Well, not what the residents want. And there's a question of morality, right? Because you have hundreds of thousands of dollars being funneled by a company, Orange Barrel, through their PAC, 
Ike Smart City, and then you have same amount, lots of money being funneled from Truth is a Daughter of Time, which was the former commissioner, who's the hired lobbyist, right? So there's this collusion to create these signs that are double the size of state standards. We have the photos <laughs> we've been showing, and here they are again. This is taken from someone's apartment, this picture right here. Yes. And this is what it looks like at night from one billboard. It's at 1,800 square feet right. billboard. Right. Um, and it is one of, there's another one, that, that one is at the uh, Art Museum in downtown Miami, the PAM. The other is slated to go into the Arsht, Correct. the Performing Arts Center up the block, up the Spain. Uh, but the county is now involved and said, nope, nope. That's, that's our property, nope. you can't do that. How did nope. that happen? Well, because the county owns uh, the property and, the, and they never received permission. The county never granted permission for that uh, sign to be erected. By the way, the city also never granted, even though it received a form of consent, it also never granted the, uh, the authority for the sign to go up for the PAM. So we have kind of like situations where folks are not following the rules. And I think I call corruption when you're evading the rules and not following them and at the expense of taxpayers and residents. That's fair. You are the District 2 Commissioner now, uh, elected after this. Yes. So when you, you're one of five commissioners mm -hmm. and on Thursday, typically what happens, but not always, well, is the District Commissioner says, here's what my district needs and wants, and the other commissioners say, okay, that's fair, we follow suit. Yes, thank you, you for saying that. You, well, I watched that happen, but it doesn't always happen. Well, what here's a great expect? example. No, what here's a great happen? example. It's really been a very tough fight, right? And I think that when we see that, when we see other districts, why should we be the district that has the biggest say? We're the ones receiving all the calls. We're the ones doing all the forms. We're the ones that know, know the topic best. However, why aren't the other ones deferring, giving that deference? Well, I would say follow the money. We, we, have, um, we have followed the money mm -hmm. in our minutes together. I can't lay them out, but there is absolutely a compelling case for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars being shell-gamed into a vote for this. But let me get the other side of the story, sure. if I may. Um, those cultural institutions stand to make a lot of revenue from those billboards. Right. So do, does the for-profit out-of-state company Right. But is it fair to say that there is a case to be made for a vehicle to give a lot of money to cultural institutions who always need it? I would say I love those cultural institutions. I would be happy to throw support behind them. And I think many other people would in a way that doesn't hurt the residents and the taxpayers in that area. And I think there are ways to do that. So that's what I would like to see. I would like to see, I mean, you don't see like the MoMA with a big LED sign. You don't see the Met. With a big LED well, let, well, let's talk about that. The, the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York City has Times Square. There are no well, bigger, lighter billboards yeah, but than Times Square. Different. <laughs> that's, yeah, Tell that's me important. why that's different if Miami wants to be like New York City. Miami doesn't. Well, that's the whole point. Miami doesn't want to be like New York City. Several people during public comments said, we don't want to be Times Square. We don't want to be Hong Kong. We don't want to be Las Vegas. It is a neighborhood now, downtown. And I think a lot of people don't want to accept that. There are people who live there. There are vertical communities. They go to the park every day. That's their home. They don't want to come home and see a huge LED sign. I, I think the most the most jarring picture is that photograph from somebody's living room yeah. where at nighttime you see that. But but on third well today is the protest. On yes. Thursday is the meeting. Damien Pardo, commissioner from D two. Yes. We will be watching to see what happens because there to your point there is a bigger picture here besides a lighted billboard that everybody from Boca to Key West can sort of think about how government operates and puts things in their neighborhood. Absolutely there is. It is really Thank great you. to have you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. And we'll be following that. <laughs> All right. Next, the color purple. Is Florida still it or not? Six months to election day, taking the temp of Florida's Democrats, trying to turn the tide. Chair Nikki Fried is here next.
Florida Democrats, especially Democratic women, converged in South Florida for a Ruth's List Weekend, the organization that trains and supports pro-choice women candidates for office. With six months to the election, the gathering takes on an urgency for Democrats working to bring Florida back to swing state purple. Nikki Freed is the Florida Democratic Party chair at the helm of it all. Madam Chair, great to have you. Thanks for having me this morning. I guess now afternoon. <laughs> afternoon. So I want to really start on the weekend events, um, the Ruth's List events, and uh, the speech that you gave, congrats on your award this weekend, but the speech that you gave talked about the real focus this election year on recruiting candidates, Democratic candidates, recruiting women to run for office. How is that going and what, what is that message? Yeah, first of all, I wore purple today for that exact message to be delivered. Um, the message is very simple, that women are going to get us out of the mess that we're currently in, whether it is because of, of lack of access to abortion rights, um, which goes into freedom, economic opportunities, um, to health care, uh, the, the dismantling of the ACA that is being pushed by Republicans of Rick Scott and, and Donald Trump. And so what we know that, that when women come together, first of all, we lead from experience, whether it is you know staying at home and raising families or it's being in the workforce. And so we're recruiting women all over the state. And right now we have all 28 of our congressional seats filled. Um, over half of them were uh, by, by women. And we are about um, one Senate seat short and about 14 Senate seats of House seats short of filling an entire slate. And a majority of those are women. And so we really feel that this is a time when women in our state are going to come together and say enough is enough. We want our rights back. We want our freedoms back. And we're ready to fight for it and to make sure that we're protecting our families, protecting our, our way of life. And it's going to be women who are going to get us out of this moment. So now I'm thinking about, um, you know, I sit here from a nonpartisan lens and I have friends everywhere of all kinds of, of different persuasions. And I'm wondering your message to Florida's Republican women, because the many, many Republican women who have vastly different politics might be listening to this saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm a woman too, and here's how I operate. No, the message is the same. You know, when we talk about reproductive health care, we talk about it in, in a way that transcends partisan politics, because to your point, this doesn't just affect Democratic women, this affects every single family in the state of Florida, whether you are, are raising um, high school students and then are ready to go off to college and all of a sudden are saying, mom, dad, I don't want to stay in a Florida school. And, and so now these families are having to find the economic resources to take their kids out of state, uh, jobs that, and corporations that are unwilling to come here to the state of Florida because their, their, their employees don't want to be here. This has impacts across the board. And ultimately, the messaging that trans sense partisan politics. Government has no business making this decision for families. This needs to be left up to the doctor, to the patient, and to whoever she prays to or whoever she wants to put in that inner circle. And that's a message that really transcends partisan politics, why we believe without a doubt that this Amendment 4 is going to pass. So I, I've listened in the past couple of weeks since the Supreme Court decision there has been so much talk about how abortion rights on the ballot in November and also recreational marijuana on the ballot as well will be a galvanizing force, a fuel to bring younger voters, uh, more Democratic voters out to the polls. But really at the moment, polls show otherwise. What, what do you make of that? No, I make of it as six months out. You know, so six months out, no money has been put on the ground. There isn't TV commercials. There isn't mail. Well, for recreational marijuana, yeah, there are now <laughs> this week. <laughs> you know, there's, just, there's just nothing. You know, that most, most, for two things, most people do not know that recreational marijuana is on the ballot in November. That's one. Um, don't know how that the federal regulations impact this in the state of Florida. So there's a lot of confusion about where we are in, in the state of cannabis in, in this moment. But even on, on abortion, I would say over 60%, if not even higher, uh, of Floridians don't know that six weeks is the law of the land here in the state of Florida. So when in the, over the next six months, when the stories start coming out, when you're hearing the heartbreaking um, you know, instances that, that, that women are gonna be sharing these stories that sometimes impacts your, your family or your friends or your colleagues, and you understand that we have a chance to take back these rights and to make sure that we're enshrining it back into the Florida Constitution, those numbers are gonna flip and more people are going to be frustrated that we are sitting in a state 
with that is as libertarian as Florida is, that has always been purple, then now we're sitting in a six week abortion ban, a virtual ban, and you know, is one of the most extreme across the country. Time is going to make sure that the messaging comes out and that people are truly understanding the impact uh, that the six week abortion ban has on Florida. At, at the moment, and I think you, you see what polls generally reflect that the big issues that most people have, and, and not the people sort of what I call the beltway, but people who don't really pay attention 24 seven to the news cycle are the economy, their kitchen table economy. And also what I found really interesting is immigration. Um, and those are, are two very big issues. And you saw that Republicans, when the president was here um, in Florida, they really focused on blaming the president for those things. And, and that's a message that Democrats really are going to have as headwinds, don't you think? I mean, how, how do you deal with that? You know, I, I think a couple of things. First of all, again, no money has been spent. And, and think about where we are. Right now, the Dow closed at the highest rate ever in history. That inflation is going down across the country. That food prices are going down. Job growth continues to expand. Now, granted, not everybody is feeling it yet. And especially here in the state of Florida, the highest inflation in the country. Property insurance is the number one issue. Those are Florida-centric issues. And the reason why Floridians haven't been able to experience some of these inflation reduction, um, more job growth here in the state of Florida, is because Ron DeSantis and the Republican Party has refused to take down those resources. And instead of not just taking them down, but has spent the better part of the last three and a half years just yelling, yelling about how bad things are, instead of trying to make things better. And so we are going to have an opportunity over the next six months to really share those messages and to make sure people understand that it is Joe Biden who has gotten us out of COVID. It is Joe Biden who's made sure that, that Americans are back at work. It is Joe Biden who is making sure that manufacturing jobs are back here in, in the state of Florida. And of course, immigration should be a, a top priority for Americans. We have to secure our border. And Democrats agree with that, so much so that they signed off on a, on a bipartisan border bill, but Donald Trump wanted the case chaos, wanted the issue for this election, and so made sure that Republicans killed it. And instead of not only killing it, um, but has also gone out and said he wants to have the largest deportation in the history of America. The chaos and the fear that that will have on so many, especially in Miami, so many families. Um, we've got six months. We have a lot of work to do, but I know that we are right on this message. A lot of work to do, a lot of money to spend, because unfortunately, on, on whichever side of the aisle you sit, it it looks like, at least in the last decade, fear as a message actually does work. Yeah, um, unfortunately that does. And, and the fear right now is women are gonna die. That the fear is that w we have these things that are happening here in the state of Florida and across the country that should make people very concerned. And the concern is if Donald Trump becomes president again, what is that gonna do to our democracy? What is that going to do to our freedoms? What is that going to do to our quality way of life when you have a president who is sitting there in the Oval Office who spends a majority of his day looking to have revenge um, and go after his opponents, people that are not loyal to him? You know, and, and bravo to every Republican in the state of Florida who felt that they had to go up and sit next to him in a criminal trial. All right, that so the, the, the national news that came before us, <laughs> took care of all of this subject, but um, Nikki Freed, I'm, I'm gonna let you go for time. Great to have you as always, and please do check in because the next six months are gonna be really important. Thanks for having me. All right, up next, tell me something good. We start a new segment this week with something and someone that is South Florida's really good news of the week. That's next. And the first place winner for the 2024 We the People National Invitational is Nova Middle School. Congratulations. What a moment. We're going to start this week a new segment called Tell Me Something Good. And to kick us off, the teacher and team from Nova Middle School, who this week became the gold standard of We the People, winning the national championship in that constitutional law competition. Kristen Murphy is that middle school teacher right here with us, fresh from DC. Will Murphy, the lawyer, partner, husband, who donated hundreds of hours to championship prep. And I'm so happy that we are starting this new segment because this is such a big deal for middle school students to bring home gold in constitutional law. Right. What, what is that contest and how'd you get them there? 
Um, we the people, it's a, it's a competition related to the U.S. Constitution. So they have to be able to discuss and debate issues related to the Constitution, not just the past and history, but also what's going on today. And they have to know it well enough to be able to form an opinion about what they're discussing. Because so that's, you know, that's not memorizing. That is knowing no. material. And what a difference for, for students to memorize something or know it and make it their own. And I guess you had a lot to do with that, Will, because you're the, oh, yeah, you're both lawyers. Yes. Right? Right? I'm mainly an arbitrator and mediator now, but yeah. I went to William and Mary, got an appreciation for history, including there, because it's a very old law school. And you have school. hundreds of hours of time to help this process. I don't keep track, but uh, <laughs> a few, yeah. It's, it's un unbelievable, the dedication he has to my students. So how do you, it, this is a, a, a project, obviously, that goes on beyond a day or a week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so when you find a, a middle school student whose interests probably don't lie in law and constitutional issues, how do you get them there? It's funny you ask that because every year when I talk about what we're going to do, I get groans. Uh, do we have to? And then about, I do that a lot. I groan a lot. Right? <laughs> and then about a month later, they're like, you know what? I really like this. It's kind of cool. I think when you add a, co a competition element to almost anything, it becomes more fun, right? And if you can show the relevance to their lives, it becomes more fun. And how do you do that? How do you show that relevance? I mean, this is a... This is where an example of what a teacher does with passion and calling comes into play, right? In a, in a school, I mean, Nova Middle is a, you know, a lot of Title I students yes. in a school. It's not like pr a privileged school where people have resources. How, how do you do that? How do you get them there? We talk a lot about things like, for example, if you don't like the, the president, the, this one, the past one, and you want to say that publicly, you can do that, and you're not going to disappear. You bring it home. Yeah, and you, there's, you, you take that for granted when you live your whole life here, but you know, there's a lot of places in the world that's not true, and you know the, the work that was done hundreds of years ago in this country is part of the reason we enjoy that now. Do, do politics come into play in this very divided time that we live in? All the time. Tell me. Um, we we don't give our opinion. We don't tell the kids you know what side we're on, for example. But we do ask them to look at both sides, um, and if and in competition, if they want to go against. A political party we ask them to acknowledge what the other party might say in response just so that they can be even-handed and fair so what we're looking at now is a zoom uh, I guess this is the zoom competition and the judges listening to them and I, I do want to bring up oh look they get time cues just like we do <laughs> yeah. I do want to bring up one of your students had to go to the hospital yes and I, I don't know if we have actually oh there she is up in yep. the upper uh, what is that left <laughs> Yeah. Upper left, really participating from the hospital, that is commitment. Yes, yes. Uh, she, she, hurt, she dislocated her knee within three hours of wa arriving to Washington, D.C., and she was immediately taken to the hospital, and she was committed to compete from the hospital. Uh, she was on the phone with her teammates late into the night, and then at 5 a.m., um, one of our chaperones, who's a nurse who was at the hospital with her, called to say she's on morphine, she can't even put a sentence together. So on day one, we didn't have her and the team had to adapt. But by day two, she was ready and she, she absolutely killed it. She was fantastic. And the people who we're looking at right now, the judges, oh, there's a whole team in front of the, the Supreme Court. Court. Yep. Yep. Um, and oh, a trip to DC too, that's pretty exciting. Yes. Do we have the tape again of the moment on the bus where they found out that they had won this, the gold, the big, big title? And the first place winner for the 2024 We the People National Invitational is Nova Middle School. Congratulations. That was, what a moment. Yeah, what I a moment. cry every time I see that. And it couldn't happen to a nicer group of kids. It, it's, it is a lot of work and it's very rewarding. They're, they're, and you would be blown away if you were able to sit down and have a conversation with them with how deep their knowledge goes and just what great kids they are. Well, I'll tell you what, let's do this. How about, we have a big audience right here looking at us, how about we bring everybody, come come get your glory, come get your due. Tell me something good. <laughs> so here we have some, I know the team is much bigger than this. Right. I know everybody's really quiet. Are middle school students always this Never. quiet? Oh no. <laughs> so here, come. you can come up here, fill in a little bit, come to the front. I want everybody to see the team from middle school. Um, who is the con law expert here, do you think? Everybody is, right? Well, he's the Federalist Papers expert. I'm this tell, all right, I know you're not on mic, but I just talk really loud. Can we, can we, uh, I'm, I'm kind of winging it here a little bit. 
Tell me about um, like the moment in, in your competition that was really amazing. Yeah, step right up. Well, it's just like, it's like crazy because like, it's like 10 months of work to like 12 minutes and like you have to just like adapt to the questions because you have like no clue. The like craziest part is like you don't know what they're going to ask them and you have to like tie it in. So this is, it's kind of like television. You don't know what they're going to ask. How do you get them through that? Uh, it's by the time it's go time, it's up to them. It's yeah. the prep work. It's how many nights a week and hours on Zoom. And multiple practice judges coming at them from different angles. People we know are going to be harder on them than the real judges are going to be. Um, who are, make a little different approach than either one of us might have, so they get questions that are phrased differently. Was, was there one moment where you sat back and thought, uh-oh? Not uh-oh, we fist bumped <laughs> quite a few times in the background. There, there was one question that was about free exercise, and one of the students oh. started answering, citing a case that's a free expression case. Uh, um, so First Amendment, but not exactly the topic, and I was starting to hold my breath, but it was the Tinker versus Des Moines case, which talks about students not leaving their rights at the courthouse door which was directly on point. It was something a, a seasoned lawyer would do, and for a 14-year-old, it was just amazing. Imagine how, you know, preparation is the key, and you never realize what that means until you have to wing it. And when you're prepared, you can wing it, right? Yep. So by a show of hands, anyone have a career path as a lawyer right now? Everybody? Is that why you're in this class? Uh, okay, so chicken and the egg issue here. So you, these kids are predisposed to want to be in, in law. I want one more question because we talk on this program so often about people being engaged and aware and we bring in a lot of young people because I'm finding younger people are much more engaged and aware than I think most would understand. They just don't do it like we did it. It's in non-traditional channels. T talk a little bit about the engagement of Nova Middle students, you know, particularly yours, in outside the school, becoming engaged in the community, taking leadership roles, watching government. I think this class has interested them. I mean, they bought books on the Federalist Papers on their own. They're watching the news, they're bringing in news articles. And the Project Citizen. Oh right, we had a, um, a, a competition called Democracy in Action. They wrote a bill to create a law to require life skills class education in high school because kids don't they did they did surveys they wrote a law it's wrote, in Tallahassee it is it's bubbling through the process it is okay that's great all right so um, everybody here watch them they're gonna be big time in your community and I, I really want to tell you how sincerely grateful I am that we can tell people something good tell me something good you guys did great congratulations Thank you. Thank and, you. and I'm, I'm so glad you joined us today Kristen Murphy Will Murphy at Nova Middle everyone at Nova Middle thanks for being with us today and um, thank you uh, of course okay and so I want to let you know if you have something or someone for our next segment of tell me something good all you have to do is let us know and we will be right back Check this out moments ago. History was made. In 1961, Ed Dwight was nominated by President John F. Kennedy to become the first black astronaut. But when President Kennedy was assassinated, he was given a list of reasons why he couldn't complete the mission and he was never able to use what he learned. This morning, 90 years young, Ed Dwight reached the stars, launched on this Blue Origin spacecraft from West Texas. What a moment. And you know what? We're going to call Ed Dwight and see if he'll be here with us next week, next Sunday. All right. To rewatch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, all you have to do is scan that QR code with your phone and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of local10.com. And you know we'd love to hear from you about anything you saw here today, anything in the news. Email us at TWISF at WPLG.com. Connect with us also really easily, social media. Find us and reach out at Glenna WPLG on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Have a beautiful Sunday. Great to have you with us. Keep in touch.